when I cast my mind back to that summer of 1936, different kinds of memories offer themselves to me. We got our first wireless set that summer. Well, a sort of a set, and it obsessed us. And because it arrived at the beginning of August, my Aunt Maggie, she was the joker of the family. She suggested we give it a name. She wanted to call it Lou, after the old Celtic god of the harvest. Because in the old days, August the 1st was La Lunasa, the feast day of the pagan god Lou. And the days and weeks of harvesting that followed were called the Festival of Lunasa. But Aunt Kate, she was a national school teacher and a very proper woman. She suggested that it would be sinful to christen an inanimate object with any kind of name, not to talk about pagan god. So we just called it Marconi because it was a name emblazoned on the set. And about three weeks after we got that wireless, my mother's brother, my Uncle Jack, came home from Africa for the first time ever. For 25 years, he worked in a leper colony there, in a remote village called Rianga. And now, in his early 50s, and in bad health, he came home to Ballybeg, as it turned out, to die. <coughs> and when I cast my mind back to that summer of 1936, these two memories of our first wireless and of Father Jack's return are always linked. So that when I recall my shock at Jack's appearance, shrunken and jaundiced with malaria, I remember at the same time, my first delight, indeed my awe, at the sheer magic of that radio. And I remember the kitchen throbbing with the beat of Irish dance music, beamed to us all the way from Dublin, and my mother and her sisters suddenly catching hands and dancing a spontaneous step, dancing and laughing, screaming like excited schoolgirls. At the same time, I see that forlorn figure of Father Jack shuffling from room to room, as if he had been searching for something, but couldn't remember what. And even though I was only a child of seven at the time, I know I had a sense of unease, some awareness of a widening breach between what seemed to be and what was, of things changing too quickly before my eyes, becoming what they ought not to be. That may have been because Uncle Jack hadn't turned out at all like the resplendent figure in my head. Or maybe because I had witnessed Marconi's voodoo derange those kind, sensible women and transform them into shrieking strangers. Or perhaps because during those Lunasa weeks of 1936, we were visited on two occasions by my father, Jerry Evans. For the first time in my life, I had a chance to observe him. We're going to get a decent mirror to see ourselves in. You can see enough to do you. I'm going to throw this old crap thing out. Indeed, you're not, Chrissy. I'm the one who broke it, and the only way to avoid seven years' bad luck is to keep on using it. You can see nothing in it. Except marred and marred wrinkles. Do you know what I think I might do? I think I might just start wearing lipstick. <laughs> do you hear this, Maggie? Steady on, girl. Today it's lipstick. Tomorrow, it's a gin bottle. I think I just might. As long as Kate's not around. Do you want to make a pagan of yourself? Far too pale. The old mousy hair. Need a bit of color. What far? What indeed? Make a nice dress that, wouldn't it? God forgive me. Will you come to Abyssinia? Will you come? Bring your own cup and saucer and the bun. Mussolini will be there with his airplanes in the air. Will you come to Abyssinia? Will you come? <laughs> not bad, Maggie. Eh? You should be on stage, Rose. And not a bad bit of leg, Maggie. Eh? Rose Mundy, where's your modesty? <coughs> Is that nor more like it? Good, Maggie. Good, good. <laughs> Look, Agnes, look. A rat pair of pegs, the two of you. <laughs> Turn on Marconi, Chrissy. I've told you a dozen times already. The battery is dead. It is not. It went for me a while ago. <laughs> you see? Dave's so rosy. <laughs> told you. That all set's useless. 
Kate will have a new battery back with her. If it's the battery that's wrong. Is Abyssinia in Africa, Aggie? Yes. Is there a war there? Yes, I've told you that. But that's not where Father Jack was, is it? Jack was in Uganda, Rosie. That's a different part of Africa. You know that. Yes, I do. I do, I know that. Will you vote for the Valera? Will you vote? If you don't, we'll be like Gandhi with his goat. Uncle Bill from Belting Last has a wireless up his Woo! <laughs> Will you vote for De Valera? Will you vote? <laughs> I'll tell you something, Rosie. The pair of us should be on the stage. The pair of us should be on the stage, Aggie. <laughs> What's that son of yours that up there? God knows, as long as he's quiet, he's making something. Looks like a kite. Michael! Woohoo! <laughs> that was the wrong thing to do. He's going to have your hair, Chris. Mine's like your wedding bush. <laughs> Will you wash it for me tonight, Maggie? Are we all off for a big dance somewhere? I'll track with Michael to bed. What about then? I'm your mom. <laughs> Put it down some buys about to play with. No, you're talking. Couldn't we all do with that? <laughs> Maggie. Wouldn't it be great if we had a... Shh. What is it? Father Jack. Hope Kate remembers his coin. I'll oh, sure remember. Kate forgets nothing. <laughs> There's going to be pictures in the hall next Saturday, Aggie. I think maybe I'll go. Yes. I might be meeting somebody there. <laughs> Who's that? I'm not saying. Do we know him? I'm not saying. Now enjoy that, Rosie. You love the last picture we saw. And he wants to bring me up to the back hills next Sunday, up to Lohana. His father has a boat there. And I'm thinking, maybe I'll bring a bottle of milk with me and have enough money saved to buy a packet of chocolate biscuits. Danny Bradley is a scut, Rose. I never said it was Danny Bradley. He's a married man with three young children. And that's just where you're wrong, Missy. So there, she left him six months ago, Aggie, and went to England. Rose, love, we just were. And who are you to talk, Christina Mandi? Don't you dare lecture me. Everybody in the town knows. And you're right. jealous too. That's what's wrong with the whole of you. You're jealous of me. He calls me his rosebud, Aggie. He waited for me outside the chapel gate last Christmas morning. And he gave me this. That's for the rosebud, he said. Is it a fish, Rosie? Isn't it lovely? And it's made of yar silver. And he brings you good luck. It is lovely. I wear it all the time, besides my miraculous medal. I love him, Aggie. I know. Bastard. Summertime was nearly over. The Italian skies above. I said, Mr. Amarova. For God's sake, I have an iron in there. What was I to know that? Don't you see me ironing? Can't you spare a sweet word of love? Now you've lost it. Get out of here, Rose, will you? Rosie, love, would you give me a hand with this? We can work a bit faster. We'll never get two dozen pairs finished this week. What are they supposed to be? Kites. Kites? God help me. What are you walking on, Maggie? You're standing on a tail. That is squeal. Add your riddles for you. Keep up. What goes round the house and round the house since it's in the corner? A broom. Why is a river like a watch? You're pathetic. Because it never goes far without winding. Harry up, Harry in, lift your foot, stab it in. What is it? Give up. Think, will you? Give up. Have you even one brain in your head? Give up. A sock. A what? A sock. You know, lift your foot then. You know what your trouble is, cub? You're a buck. Stupid. Look out, there's a rat. Where, where, where? Just Mary Joseph, where is it? <laughs> Caught you again, Aunt Maggie. You evil wee brat. Get you for that, Michael. Don't you worry. I won't forget that. And I had a barley sugar sweet for you. Are there bits of cigarette tobacco stuck to it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Someday you're going to fill some woman's life full of happiness. There. I hope it chokes you. Look, <laughs> you When I saw Uncle Jack for the first time, the reason I was so shocked by his appearance that I expected, well, I suppose, the hero from a schoolboy's book. Once I had seen a photograph of him, radiant and splendid in his officer's uniform. It had fallen out of Aunt Kate's prayer book. She snatched it from me before I could study it in detail. 
There's a picture taken in 1917 when he was a chaplain to the British forces in East Africa, and he looked magnificent. But Aunt Kate had been involved locally in the War of Independence, so Father Jack's brief career in the British Army was never referred to in that house. All the same, the wonderful Father Jack of that photo was the image that lodged in my mind. But if he was a hero to me, he was a hero and a saint to my mother and to my aunts. They poured over his occasional letters. They prayed every night for him, for his slippers and for the success of his mission. They scraped and saved for him, six pence here, a shilling there, sacrifices they made willingly, joyously, so that they could have enough money to send for him at Christmas and for his birthday. And every so often, when a story would appear in the Donegal Inquirer about our very own leper priest, as they called him, because Ballybeg was proud of him, the whole of Donegal was proud of him. And it was only natural that my family would enjoy a small share of that fame. It gave us a, that little bit of status in the eyes of the parish. And it must have helped my aunts to bear the shame mother brought on the household by having me, as it was called then, out of wedlock. <laughs> Their faces. Oh. I painted them. Oh, good Lord, they put the heart across me. You did those? Those are scarifying. What are they? Devils. Ghosts. Men like those lads up in the sky looking down at me. Hold on now. Do you know what this is? Of course you do. A spinning top. Goodbye. And this? This is the whip. You know how to use it. Indeed, you do. What do you say? Thanks. Thank you, Aunt Kate. And do you know what I have in here? Spinning top. A new library book. It has colored pictures. We'll begin reading it at bedtime. Call me the moment you're ready to fly. I wouldn't miss it for the whole world. Do you know what he's at out there? Did you see Christina making two kites? Some kites in make. Oh, I'll buy yourself. No help from anybody. You always said he was talented, Kate. No question about that. Very mature for his years. Very cheeky for his years. I think he's beautiful, Chris. I wish he was mine. Is that a spinning top he has? It's nothing. Oh, Kate, you have him spoiled. Where did you get it? Morgan's Arcade. I'm sure he didn't even thank you. I know why you went into Morgan. Indeed, he did. He's very mannerly. You wanted to see Austin Morgan. Every field along the road, they're all out there at the hay and the card. Because you have a notion of that old Austin Morgan. Could it be a good harvest by the look of it? I know you have. She's blushing. Look, isn't she blushing? You need to put a stitch in that hand, Rosie. But what you don't know is that he's going with the wee young thing from Karakfad. Rose, what Austin Morgan does or doesn't do. Why are you blushing then? She's blushing, isn't she? Why? Why? Why, Kate? Oh, for God's sake, Rose, shut up, would you? Anyhow, we all know we all... Pass me those still needles, would you please? Are you tired? That road from town gets longer every day. You can laugh if you want, but I'm going to get that old bike fixed up, and I'm going to learn to ride this winter. Many about Ballybeg. Ballybeg's off its head, I'm telling you. Everywhere you go, everyone you meet, it's the one topic. Are you going to the harvest dance? Who are you going with? What are you wearing? This year is going to be the biggest ever and the best ever. I remember some great harvest dances, don't we all? Another one of those riveting Annie M.P. Smiths and novels for you, Agnes. Ah, thanks. The marriage of Nurse Harding. Oh, dear. <laughs> and for you, Christina, one teaspoonful every morning before breakfast. What's this? Cod liver aisle. You're far too pale. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> because you take no exercise. Anyhow, I'm in the chemist shop this morning, and this young girl, wee slip of a thing, and can't even remember her name. Uh, her mother is the knitting agent that buys her gloves, Agnes. Uh, Vera McCotlin. Her daughter, whatever she's called. Sophia. 
Miss Sophia, who must be all of 15, comes up to me and says, I hope you're not going to miss the harvest dance, Miss Mundy. It's going to be just supreme this year. And honest to God, it seemed the look in her eyes. You think it was heaven she was talking about. Oh, if it's head, I'm telling you, like a fever in the place. That's the quinine. The doctor says it won't cure the malaria, but it may help contain it. Uh, is he in his room? He's wandering about the back somewhere. I told the doctor you thought him very quiet, Agnes. Yes. Well, didn't you? And the doctor says we must remember how strange everything must be for him after so long. And on top of that, Swahili was his language for the last 25 years. So it's not that his mind is confused. It's just that he has difficulty finding the English words for what he wants to say. No matter what the doctor says, Kate, his mind is a bit confused. Sometimes he doesn't know the difference between us. I've heard him calling you Rose, and he keeps calling me some strange name like... Uh, Okawa? That's it. Aggie, you've heard him, haven't you? Okawa was his house boy. He was very uh, attached to him. I, I think I'm getting corns in this foot. I hope to God I don't end up crippled like poor mother. Oh, may she rest in peace. Wouldn't it be a good one if we all went? Went where? To the heart of his dance. Aggie! Just like we used to. <clears throat> all dressed up. I think I'd go. I'd go too, Aggie. I'd go with you. For heaven's sake, you're not serious, Agnes, are you? I think I am. <laughs> There's more than belly makes off its head. I think we should all go. Have you any idea what it'd be like? Crawling with cheeky young brats I taught years ago. I'm game. We couldn't, Aggie, could we? And all the riffraff from the countryside. Oh, I'm game. Oh, God, Aggie. You know how much I love dancing. <laughs> what do you say? You have a seven-year-old child. Have you forgotten that? You could wear that blue dress yeah. of mine. You have the figure for it, and it brings out the color of your eyes. Can I have it? God, Aggie. I could dance non-stop all night, all week, all month. <laughs> and who'd look after Father Jack? And you look great in that cotton dress you got for confirmation last yes. year. You're beautiful in it, Kate. Well, that's sort of silly talk. And you could wear me brown shoes. The cross summer straps. This is silly talk. We can't, Agnes. How can we? Will Maggie go with us? Will Maggie what? Try to stop her. <laughs> oh, God, Agnes. What do you think? We're going. Are we? We're off. <clears throat> we're away. Maybe we're mad. Are we mad? Costs four and six to get in. I have ten pounds save. I'll take you. I'll take us all. Hold on now. <laughs> How many years has it been since we were at the harvest dance? At any dance. And I don't care how young they are, how drunk and sweaty and dirty they are. I want to dance, Kate. It's the festival of Luna, sir. And I'm only 35. I want to dance. I know, Agnes, <laughs> I know. All the same, it's I settled. We're going. The Monday girls, all five of us together. Like we used to. Like we used to. <laughs> I love you, Aggie. I love you more than chocolate biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Will, Will you come, come to Abyssinia? Will you come? Bring your own cup and saucer and a bun. No! <clears throat> no. No. We are going nowhere. If we all want to go. Just look at yourselves, will you? Just look at yourselves. Dancing at our time of day. That's for young people with nothing in their heads but do pleasure, no duties or responsibilities. I think we Do you want the whole countryside laughing at us? Women of our years, mature women, dancing. Let's come over all of you. And on top of that, this is Father Jack's home now. We must never forget that. Ever. No. No, we are going to no part of that. But you just said- And there'll be no more discussion about it. The matter's over. I don't want it mentioned again. The fox is back. Did you see him? He has a whole trip in the house door. Did you get a look at him, Aunt Maggie? Was my talking to him? He was asking for you. Ha ha. What's that you've got in your hands? Something I found. What? Sitting very still at the foot of the holly tree. Show me. Say please three times. Please, please, please. Swahili. Are you going to show it to me or do you not? Now, cub. Put your ear over here. Listen. Do you hear it? I think so. Yes. What do you hear? Something. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Show me on Maggie. Right. Get back a bit. 
Spins further. Ready? Yes. What was it? Did you see it? I think so. Yes. Wasn't it wonderful? Was it a bird? Colors are so beautiful. Trouble is, just one quick glimpse. That's all you ever get. If you miss that. What was it, Aunt Maggie? Don't you know what it was? It was all in your mind. Now we quit. <laughs> I'm sick of that white rooster of yours, Rosie. Some thought that. Look at the lump it took out of my arm. So you don't speak to him, right? I know the speaking he'll get from me. The weight of my boot. Jelly. Would you put some turf on that fire, Chrissy? I'm going to make some sort of bread. Watch out. She's in one of her cranky moods. Here, ten wild woodbine, Maggie. Great. The tongue's out of mine. You missed it all, Maggie. What did I miss this time? We were all going to go to the harvest dance, like the old days, and then Kate. Your shoes, Rose. Hmm. The shoemaker says whichever kind of feet you have, only the insides of your soles wear out. Is that a bad thing? That is neither a bad thing nor a good thing, Rose. It is just distinctive, as might be expected. <laughs> have you look, uh... It's kind of a penny for some reason. And sugar for the blackberry jam. If we ever get the blackberries. Look at the packet of wild woodbine she got me. What's wrong with it? Only nine cigarettes. They're so wild. One of them has have escaped on her. <laughs> Doesn't Jack sometimes call you Okawa too, Maggie? Yes, what does it mean? Okawa was his house boy, Kate says. Damn it. Thought it was Swahili for gorgeous. <laughs> Maggie. That's the very thing we could do with him. A house boy. And the battery. The man at the shop says we go through these quicker than anyone in Valley Bay. Good for us. And I met the parish priest today. I don't know what has happened to that man. But ever since Father Jack came home, he can hardly look me in the eye. That's because you keep winking at him, Kate. <laughs> he was always moody, that man. Maybe that's it. Uh, paper and matches. The word's not good on that young Sweeney boy from the back hills. He was anointed last night. And they didn't know he was dying? Not an inch of his body that isn't burned. Does anybody know what happened? Some silly prank up in the back hills. Oh, poor boy. Knows he's dying. Just lays there moaning. What sort of prank? How'd I know? What are they saying in the town? I know no more than I've told you, Christina. It was last Sunday week, the first night of the Festival of Lunasa, and they were doing what they do every year up there in the back hills. Festival of Lunasa? What sort first, of? They light a bonfire beside a spring well, then they dance round it. Then they drag their cattle through the flames to banish the devil out of them. Banish the You don't know the first thing about this year there was an extra big crowd of boys and girls and they were off their heads with drink. And young Sweeney's trousers caught on fire and he went up like a torch. That's what happened. Who filled your head with that nonsense? They do it every Lunasa. That's what happened, I'm telling you. And they're savages! I know those people from the back hills. I've taught them. Savages. That's what they are. And what pagan practices they have are no concern of ours. None whatever. It's a sorry day to hear talk like that in a Christian home. A Catholic home. All I can say is that I'm shocked and disappointed to hear you repeating rubbish like that, Rose. That's what happened. Then All the same, it would be very handy in the winter time to have a wee house boy to feed the hens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I beg your pardon, uh, the wrong apartment. Oh, forgive me. Come in and join us, Jack. May I? You're looking well, Jack. Yes. I expected to enter the bedroom through the... Oh, what I am missing, what I require. I had a handkerchief in my pocket, and I think perhaps Here's I... Here's a handkerchief. I thank you. I am grateful. It is strange I don't remember the... the, the architecture, the, the, the planning. The, the layout. I don't recollect the layout of this home scarcely. That is strange, isn't it? I thought the front door was there. You walk down to the village to buy stores, Agnes. It's Kate. And, um, everyone was asking for you. Oh, 
They remember me. Of course they remember you. And when you're feeling a bit stronger, they'll have a great public welcome for you. Bands, flags, speeches, everything. Why would they do all this? Because they're delighted you're back. Yes. Because they're delighted you're home. I'm afraid I don't remember them. I couldn't name ten people in Ballybeg now. It'll all come back to you. Don't worry. You think so? Yes, it will. Perhaps I feel the climate so cold. If you'll forgive me. Why don't you lie down for a while? Oh, I may do that. Oh, thank you. You are most kind. It'll be a slow process, but he'll be fine. Uh, mar margarine? Cornflour? Then wait till you hear. Who did I meet at the post office today? Maggie, you listening to me? Yes. You'll never believe it. Your old pal, Bernie O'Donnell. Home from London. First time back in 20 years. Bernie. Absolutely gorgeous. Figure of a girl of 18, dressed to kill from head to foot. And hair as black and as curly as the day she left. I can't tell you. A film star. Bernie O'Donnell. And beside her, two of the most beautiful children you've ever laid eyes on. Twins. They'll be 14 next month to see the three of them together. Like sisters, I'm telling you. Twin girls. Identical. Identical. Nina and Nora. Mother used to say twins are a double blessing. <laughs> and wait till you hear their pure love. Where in the name of God did the blonde hair come from, I asked her. The father, Eric, she said. He's from Stockholm. Stockholm? Where is Stockholm, Abby? So there you are, Bernie O'Donnell married to a Swede. I couldn't believe it. But the same old bubbly, laughing, happy Bernie, asking about everyone by name. She remembered us all, knew all about Michael, had his age down to the very month. Was Agnes still the quickest knitter in Valley Bay? And weren't none of us thinking of getting married? And weren't we wise? <laughs> Did you remember me? Rose had the sweetest smile I ever saw. There. But especially <laughs> for you, Maggie. How you were doing, what you were doing, how you were looking. Were you still as lighthearted as ever? Whenever she thinks of you, she says, she has the memory of the two of you sitting behind a turf stack, passing a cigarette between you, falling about laughing about some boy. Uh, what was it? Uh, curly somebody. Curly McDade, an Egypt of a fella. Ooh. Bold as Nugget 17. <laughs> Bernie O'Donnell, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, she'll be around for a while. I'm leaving tomorrow. You won't see her. <clears throat> That's a pity. Mm. Nice names, aren't they? Nina and Nora? I like Nora. Nice name, strong name. Not so sure about Nina. Do you like Nina for a name? Nina? No, not a lot. Well, if there is a Saint Nina, I'm afraid she's not in my prayer book. Maybe she's a Swedish saint. Saints in Sweden? What will be next? <laughs> Mother used to say twins are a double blessing. You've offered us that cheap wisdom already, Rosie. <laughs> You've got some flour on your nose, Maggie. When I was 16, I remember slipping out one Sunday night. It was this time of year, the beginning of August. And Bernie and I met at the gate of the workhouse. A pair of us ran off to dance in our shop. I was being pestered by a fellow named Tim Carlin at the time. But it was really Maria McGuinness that I was, that I was keen on. Remember Brian with the white hands and the longest eyelashes you ever saw? But of course, he was crazy about Bernie. Anywho, the two boys took us on the bar of their bikes and off the four of us headed to Rajdraw. 15 miles each way. Daddy had no one make the rest in peace. And at the end of the night, there was a competition for the best military two-step. And it came down to three couples. The local pair from Rajdraw, we, Timmy and myself, who was up to there, hung me. And Brain and Bernie. And they were just so beautiful together. So stylish. You couldn't take your eyes off them. People just stopped dancing and gazed at them. When the judges announced the winners, they must have been blind drunk. Naturally, the local couple came first. 
So me and myself came second. Brain and Bernie came third. Poor Bernie was stunned. Couldn't speak. Couldn't talk to any of us for the rest of the night. Wouldn't have been cycled home with us. She was right too. They should have one. They're just so beautiful together. That's the last time I saw Brian McGinnis. Remember Brian with the... Next thing I heard, he had left for Australia. She was right too, Bernie. They should have one. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair at all. I mean, I must have been blind drunk with those judges. Whoever they were. Is it working now, Christina? Was that? Marconi. Marconi? Yes. Yes. Should be. Sunday shoes, Kate. It isn't Sunday, is it? Oh dear, suddenly very logical, aren't we? I'll tell you something else. This Ginger Rogers has seen better days. So cigarettes kill you, Maggie. Wonderful wild woodbine. Next best thing to a wonderful wild man. What a dry kitty. Go and wash your face, Maggie, and for goodness sake, tie those laces. Yes, miss. Where's Michael, Chrissy? Working out those kites, isn't he? He's not there, he's gone. He won't go far. He was there 10 minutes ago. He'll be all right if he goes down to the old well. Just leave him alone for once, will you please? Who's making the tea this evening? Who makes the tea every evening? The connections seem to be all right. Oh, take that surplus off, Christina. Maybe a valve has gone. If I knew what a valve looks like. Have you no sense of propriety? If you ask me, we should throw it out. I'd be all for that if junk that set. Got them and bloody useless. And you'll buy a new one, will you? It was never any good. And you'll buy a new one out of your glove money, will you? I thought what you and Rose earned knitting gloves was hardly sufficient to clothe the pair of you. This isn't your classroom, Kate. But now it stretches into buying a new wireless. Wonderful. Please, Kate. Because I've never seen any of it being offered up for the upkeep of this house. I make every meal of the week. You see down too. Maybe I should start knitting gloves. I wash every stitch of clothes you wear. I polish your shoes. I make your bed. We both do. Rose and I. Paint the house, sweep the chimney, cut the grass, save the turf. But you have your Kate, our two unpaid servants. And do you know what your nickname at school is? The Gander. <laughs> Everybody calls you the Gander. Come here till you see. Look who's coming up the lane. Who's coming? Oh, the fucking limbs of him. Oh, I'm certain it. Who is it? It's Jerry Evans, Chrissy. Christ almighty. He's at the bend of the lane. 
Oh, Jesus Christ Almighty. How dare that heaven's creature show his face here? He wants to see his son, doesn't he? No welcome for that creature here. Who hid my son this year? And we'll have to get him to see. I don't see why we should. There's nothing in the house. No visitor at all coming here and upsetting everybody. Anybody got to try shoelaces? Oh, look at the state of the floor. Maybe he just wants to meet Father Jack. Father Jack may have something to say to Mr. Evans. My wood vine. Agnes, put those clothes away. Where's my wood vine? He won't stay the night, Jake, will he? He most certainly won't be staying the night in this house. Have you been poor, Aggie? Everyone behaves quite normally. Be very calm, very uh, uh, dignified. Anybody got a swine? Oh, stop keeping out, Rosie. There is nobody coming at all. Let me see. Imagine this, Maggie. Oh, God. Not there at all. Yes, he is. Maggie's right. There he is. Show me. Has he a walking stick? Yes. And a straw hat? Yes. Is Mr. Evans all right? Yes, there he is. Oh, sweet God. Look at the state of me. What will I say to him? How close is he? Couldn't look that man in the face. I just hate him. Hate him. That's a very unchristian thing to say, Rose. There's no luck and talk like that. Look at me hands, Kate. I'm shaking. You're not shaking. You're perfectly calm and you're looking beautiful. And what you're going to do is this. You're going to meet him outside and you are going to tell him his son is happy and healthy. And then you're going to send him packing. Yourself and Michael are managing quite fine on your own, as you always have. Of course, invite him in and give the creature his tea and stay the night if he wants to. But in the outside loft and alone. Now I uh, brought a paper home with me. Did anyone see where I left it? Where is he, Maggie? In the garden. Agnes, do you see where I left the paper? It's on the turf box, Kate. Mm. <sighs> How are you, Chrissy? Great to see you. Hello, Jerry. And how have you been for the past six months? Thirteen months. Thirteen? Never. July last year. July the seventh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where does the time go? Thirteen months. Phew. A dozen times. Two dozen times I got the visit. And then something turned up and I couldn't get away. Well, you're here now. I certainly am. That was a bit of good fortune. Last night in a bar in Sligo, bumped into this chappy with a brand new Morris Cali, who lets it slip that he's headed for Ballybag in the morning. Ballybag! Something familiar about that name. <laughs> so here I am, in the flesh as a matter of interest. A bit of good luck that, wasn't it? Yes. You just let it slip, and here I am. Oh yes, wonderful luck. <laughs> Yes. Looks terrified, the poor fella. Terrified my foot. Come here till you see him, <laughs> Maggie. Not just now. I'm sure he could do it a good meal. I'll give him three minutes, and if she doesn't hurt him, I will. You're looking wonderful, Christy. Really great. Terrific. Your hair is like your windbush. Looks lovely to me. Maggie's going to wash it for me tonight. And how's Maggie? Fine. <laughs> and Rose and Kate. Grand. And Agnes. Everybody's well, thanks. Tell her I was asking for her, Agnes. I would ask you in, but the place No, is... no. Some other time. Thanks all the same. The old schedule is a bit tight today. And the, the chappy who gave me the lift tells me Father Jack's home. Just a few weeks ago. All the way from Africa. Yes. Safe and sound. Yes. Terrific. Yes. Lucky man. Yes. Must take up some exercise. Put it on too much weight. <laughs> He's not still there, is he? Yes. Doing what in God's name? Talking. Could someone please explain to me what they possibly have to say to each other? He's Michael's father, Kate. That responsibility never burdened Mr. Evans. A commercial traveler called him to Kate's school last Easter. He had met you somewhere in Dublin. <laughs> he had some stupid story about you giving dancing lessons up there. He was right. He was not, Jerry. Across the old ticker. Real lesson. All last winter. What sort of dancing? Strictly ballroom. 
you're the one should have been giving them. You were always far better than me. Don't you remember? <laughs> oh, that was fun while it lasted. I enjoyed that. And people came to you to be taught. Don't look so surprised. Everybody wants to dance. I had thousands of pupils. Millions. Jeremy. 53. <laughs> I'm a liar, 51. <laughs> and when the good weather came, they all drifted away. Shame, really. Yes, I enjoyed that. But I've just started a completely new career as a matter of interest. Never been busier. Gramophone salesman. Agent for the whole country, if you don't mind. Minerva Gramophones. No eyes, by. Sounds good, Jerry. Fabulous. All I have to do is get the orders and pass them out to Dublin. A big enterprise receipt. One very big enterprise. And it's going all right for you? Unbelievable. The whole seller can't keep up with me. You see, this country, this country is gramophone crazy. Give you an example. The day before yesterday, just west of Uktuma, spots this small house up on the side of a hill. Something seems just right about it, you know. Off the bike, off the lane, knocks. Out come this enormous chappy with red hair. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Jerry. I promise you. I show him the brochure, and we talk about it for 10 minutes. But just like that, he takes four. One for himself, and three for the married daughters. He took four gramophones. Four brochures. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll buy. I promise you he'll buy. <clears throat> I tell you this, Chrissy. People thought gramophones would be a thing of the past when radios came in. But they were wrong. My experience. Don't turn around. But he's watching us from behind that bush. Michael. Don't pretend you know him. Just carry on. This, all his stuff. He's making a if you don't mind. Unbelievable. Got a glimpse of him down at the foot of the lane. He's just in arms. He's in school, you know. Never. Whoa, 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 whoa. Since when? Since Christmas. Kate got him in early. Fabulous, he likes it. He doesn't say much. He loves it. He adores it. They all love school nowadays. He'll be brilliant at school. Actually, I plan on bringing him something small. No, no, his son. Just a token, really. As a matter of interest, I was looking at the bicycle and felt him last Monday. But they only had it in blue, and I thought black might be more, you know, manly. <laughs> they took my name in all. Call next time I'm down there. Are you busy yourself? Oh, the usual. Housework, looking after his lordship. Wonderful. <laughs> Give Agnes and Rosa Hannah their knitting. The odd bit of sewing. Pity you don't sell sewing machines. That's an idea. The two chops together make an absolute fortune. You have the most unbelievable business, I could see. Never met anything like it. <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> you should see the way she's looking at him. You'd think he was the biggest top in the world. Tinker, more likely. Loafer, wastrel. She knows all that too? Two. That's all there is. Come over till you see the Magnus. Not just now. You'd never guess what I met on the road up from the town. Talk about good luck. A cow with a single horn coming straight up the middle of its forehead. You never did. As God is my judge, walking along by itself, nobody near it. Jerry. Just as I was passing it, it stopped and looked me straight in the eye. That was no cow he meant. That was a unicorn. Go ahead and mock. <laughs> a unicorn has the body of a horse. This was a cow. Perfectly <coughs> ordinary brown cow, except it had a single horn. Just here. But I tell you a lie. <laughs> Go ahead, laugh. But that's what I saw. Wasn't that a spot of good luck? Was it? A cow with a single horn. Oh yes, that must be a good omen. How many cows like that have you ever met? Thousands? Millions? Stop that. <laughs> I'm sure it was the only one in Ireland. Maybe the only one in the world. And I met it on the road to Ballybank. And it winked at me. He never mentioned that. What? That it winked at you. Unbelievable. That's what made it all so mysterious. Oh yes, that must be a fabulous omen. Maybe this week I'm going to sell a gramophone or two after all. But I thought you... Look! A single magpie. That's definitely a bad omen. One for song. Bad. Missed. Where's my lucky cow? Come back, old cow. Come back. 
They're not still talking, are they? Laughing. She laughs all the time when she's with him. Do you hear them, Maggie? Yes. Laughing absolutely beyond my comprehension. Like so many things, Kate. Two more minutes and Mr. Evans is going to be talking to me, laughing. <laughs> Thinking of going away for a while, I see. Where to? But I'll come back to say goodbye first. Are you going home to Wales? <laughs> Wales isn't my home anymore. My home is here. Well, Ireland. To Spain, as a matter of interest. Just for a short while. To sell gramophones? Good God, no! <laughs> You'll never believe this. To do a spot of fighting with the International Brigade. A company leaves in a few weeks. A bit ridiculous, isn't it? But you know, old Jerry. And the blood's up. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Missing everybody. What do you know about Spain? Oh, not a lot. A little. Enough, maybe. Yes, I know enough. And I thought I should try my hand at something worthy for a change. Give Evans a big pause and he won't let you down. It's only everyday stuff he's not so successful at. Anyhow, I've still to list. You still watching? He thinks you don't see him. I wouldn't mind talking to him. He's a bit shy. Naturally. And I'm a stranger to him, practically. Does he know my name? Of course he knows your name. Good. Thanks. Well, maybe not so good. He's a very handsome child. With your eyes. Lucky boy. Good for you, Aggie. You have a gramophone. What did you do to it? I could have got it for you wholesale. I didn't touch it. It's a wireless set. Oh, very posh. Turn that thing off, Agnes, would you? It doesn't go half the time. Aggie says it's a heap of junk. I know nothing about radios, but I'll take a look at it. Some you... other time. When you come back? And Agnes as well? Fine. Fine. Of all your sisters. Agnes was the one who seemed to least object to me. Tell her I was asking for her. I'll tell her. <coughs> Good tune. Jerry. Don't talk. What are you asking? Not a word. Gosh, Jerry. They're watching us. Who is? Aggie and Maggie from, from the kitchen window. Hope so. And Kate. And the father of Jack. Interesting. Terrific. They're dancing. What? They're dancing together? Oh, God forgive you. He has her in his arms. He has not! The animal! They're dancing around the garden, Aggie! Oh, what a fool of a woman. The beautiful dancer, isn't he? He's leading her astray again, Maggie. Look at her face. He's red. Come over till you see them, Agnes! I'm busy, for God's sake. Can't you see I'm busy? That's the only thing that Heaven's creature could ever do well. Dance. Oh, the fool. Would you look? The fool of a woman. Her whole face alters when she's happy, doesn't it? They dance so well together. They're such a beautiful couple. She's as beautiful as Bernie O'Donnell any day, isn't she? Do you know the words? I don't know any words. Neither do I. It doesn't matter. This is more important. Marry me, Chrissy. Are you listening to me? I hear you. Will you marry me when I come back in two weeks? I don't think so, Jerry. I'm mad about you. No, I am. I've always been mad about you. When you're with me. Leave this house. They come away but with you. But you'd walk out on me again. You wouldn't intend to, but that's what would happen. Because that's your nature, and you can't help yourself. Not this time, Chrissy. This time, it will be don't different. Don't talk anymore. No more words. Just dance me down the lane, and then you'll leave. Believe me, this time the omens are terrific. The omens are unbelievable this time. Is there a way? Dancing. Thing. That's all it seems to last a few minutes at a time. 
Something to do with the way it heats up. Now, we probably won't see Mr. Evans for another year till the humor subtly takes him back again. He has a Christian name. And in the meantime, it's Christina's heart that will get crushed. That's what I mind. But what really infuriates me is that the creature has no sense of ordinary duty. Does she ever wonder how Christina clothes or feeds Michael? Does he ask her? Does he care? Going out to get me head cleared. Bit of a headache all day. Seems to me the beasts in the field are more concerned for their young than that creature has. Do you ever listen to yourself, Kate? You are such a damn righteous bitch! And his name is Jerry. Jerry! Jerry! What was that about? Who's to say? Don't I know his name is Jerry? What am I calling him? St. Patrick. <laughs> She's worried about this too. That's exactly what a creature like Mr. Evans does. Appears out of nowhere and suddenly poisons the atmosphere of the whole house. The bastard! God, forgive him. There. That's what I mean. God, forgive me. It was on the Isle of Capri that we found her. Beneath the shade of an old olive tree. If you knew your prayers half as well as you knew the words of those old pagan songs. She's right, isn't she? I am a righteous bitch, aren't I? As <laughs> <laughs> sweet as a rose at the dawning, where they met on the Isle of Capri. Who's for a foxtrot? You work hard at your job. You try to keep the home together. You perform your duties the best you can because you believe in responsibilities and obligations and good order. And then suddenly, suddenly you, re you realize that hair cracks are appearing everywhere, that control is slipping away, that the whole thing is so fragile that you can't be held together much longer. It's all about to collapse, Maggie. Nothing's about to collapse, Kate. That young Sweeney boy from the back hills. The one who was anointed. His trousers didn't catch fire, as Rose said. They were doing some devilish thing with a goat, some sacrifice for the Lunasa Festival. And young Sweeney was so drunk, he toppled over into the middle of the bonfire. I don't know why that came into my head just now. <laughs> Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans is off for another 12 months, and next week or the week after, Christina will collapse into another one of her depressions. Remember last winter? All the sobbing and lamenting in the middle of the night? I don't think I could go through that again. The doctor says he doesn't think Father Jack's mind is confused, but that his superiors had no choice but to send him home, whatever he means by that, Maggie. And. I did meet the parish priest today. He told me that the numbers in the school are falling, and that there may not be a job for me after the summer. But the numbers aren't falling, Maggie. Why does he want to rid of me? Why is he telling me lies? And why is he not to come out to visit Father Jack? If he gives me the push, all five of us will be together all day long. <laughs> we can spend the day dancing to Marco. Kate. But what worries me most is Rose. If I die, if I lose my job, what will become of our Rosie? I must put my trust in God, Maggie, mustn't I? He'll look after her, won't he? You believe that, don't you? I believe that, too. I do believe that. I believe that. Well, now that you've had a good look at him, what did you think of him? Do you remember him? I never saw him before. Shh. Yes, you did. Five or six times. You've forgotten. And he saw you at the foot of the lane. He thinks you've got very big. And he thinks you're handsome. Aunt Kate got me a spinning top that won't spin. <laughs> <laughs> He's handsome. Isn't he handsome? Give up. I'll tell you a secret. The others aren't to know. He has got a great new job, and he's wonderful at it. What does he do? Shh. 
and he has bought you a bicycle. A black bike. A man's bike. And he's going to bring it with him the next time he comes. Is he coming back soon? Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Yes, he is. How soon? Next week? The week after? Soon, soon, soon. Oh, yes. You have a handsome father. You are a lucky boy. And I am a very, very lucky woman. Ooh. And another bit of good news for you, lucky boy. You have your mother's eyes. <laughs> and what's the good news here? The good news is that's the most exciting talk of her bird. <laughs> uh, Jerry's not gone, is he? Just this minute, he says to thank you very much for the offer of the bed. Next time he's back. That'll be in a week or two, depending on his commitments. Well, if the outside lot happens to be empty. And he sends his love to you all. Mm. His special love to you, Aggie. And a big kiss. For me? Yes, for you. Those are beautiful, Aggie. But Jack can like them in his room. Put them on his window seal with their weak heart roses so that the poor man's head doesn't go demented looking for the word. <laughs> <laughs> now for the daily dilemma. What's for the tea? Let me make the tea, Maggie. We'll both make the tea. Perhaps something thrilling with tomatoes. We've got two, I think. Or if you're willing to wait, I'll get that soda bread made. I'm making the tea, Maggie. Let me please, just today. I make the tea every evening, don't I? Why shouldn't I make it this evening, as usual? No reason at all. Aggie's the chef. <clears throat> Everybody's doing it, doing it, doing it, picking the nuts. Maggie? <laughs> if she knew her prayers half as well as she knows the world is a little pig and so. <laughs> Marconi, my friend, you're not still asleep, are you? If anybody's looking for me, I'll be down at the bank of the river for the rest of I beg your pardon, my mind was... Uh, it's Kate! It's Kate? And Agnes? And Margaret? How are you today, Jack? And this is... Chris. Christina. Oh, forgive me, Chris. You were only a baby when I went away. I remember Mother lifting you up as the train was pulling out of the station and her catching your hand and waving it at me. You were so young, you scarcely had any hair, but she managed to attach a tiny pink, a tiny pink, uh, a bow, a bow, right about here. And when she waved her hand, the bow fell off. It's like a, a picture, a, a camera picture. It's like a photograph. It's like a photograph in my mind. <laughs> the hair isn't much better even now, Jack. Oh, and I remember you were crying, Margaret. Was I? Oh, yes, her face was all blotchy with tears. You may be sure. Beautiful as ever. Oh, and you and Kate were on Mother's right, and Rose was in between you. We each had a hand. And I remember Mother's face showed nothing. I often wondered about that afterwards. She knew she would never see you again in her lifetime. I know that, but in the other life, do you think, perhaps, Mother didn't believe in the ancestral spirits? Ancestral? What are you blathering about, Jack? <coughs> Mother was a saintly woman who knew she was going straight to heaven. And you must remember to take your medicine today. The doctor says you must take it three times a day. There was a priest that took so much quinine, he became an addict and almost died. <laughs> a German priest, Father Sharpeggy, he was rushed to the hospital in Kampala, but they could do nothing for him. So, Okawa and I brought him to our local medicine man, and Karl Sharpeggy lived until he was 88. There was a strange white bird on my windowsill when I woke up this morning. That's Rosie's pet rooster. Keep away from that thing. Look at what it did to my arm. One of these days I'm going to wring its neck. Oh, that's what we do in Riyanga when we want to please the spirits or appease them. We kill a rooster or a young goat. It's quite the exciting exhibition. 
<laughs> oh, that's not the word, is it? A de demonstration? No, uh, show? Uh, no, no, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, spectacle? No, no, that's not it. Uh, the word for a sacred and mysterious... Uh, you have a ritual killing. You offer sacrifice. You have dancing and incantations. What's the word for that whole... Uh, for that? Gone. Lost it. Uh, my vocabulary has deserted me. Uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. I think perhaps Did I should put on more Did you speak Swahili clothes. all the time out there, Jack? Huh. Hey. Yes, all the time. To the people Swahili. Oh, when the Europeans call, we speak English. Or when we get a visitor, a visitation from the district commissioner. The present commissioner knows Swahili, but he won't speak it. He's a stubborn man. He and I fight a lot, but I like him. The Irish outcast, he calls me. He's always inviting me to spend a weekend with him in Kampala to keep me from going native, as he calls it. Perhaps when I go back. Oh, if you cooperate with the English, they give you lots of money for churches, schools, and hospitals. Gets so angry at me because I won't take his money. Reported me to my superiors in Head House last year, and they were very cross. Oh, very cross. But I like him. When I was saying goodbye to him, oh, he thought this was very funny. He gave me a present of the last governor's ceremonial hat to take home with. Oh, that's the word, a ceremony. Oh, how could I have forgotten that? Oh, the, the, the dancing, the ritual, the offering. Ah, oh, ceremony. How could I have forgotten such a simple word? Oh, what was I telling you again? The district commissioner gave you this present. Yes, a wonderful triangular hat with three enormous peacock plumes rising up from the crown. Oh, I have it in one of my trunks. I'll show it to you later. Oh, do you know what I found very strange? On the boat ride back home, there were days when I couldn't remember even the simplest words. Not that anyone seemed to notice. And you can always point, Maggie, can't ya? Or make signs. Or make signs. Or dance. What you must do is read a lot. Books, magazines, newspapers, everything. I read to young Michael every evening. It's great for his vocabulary. Oh, you're right, Kate. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Oh, I haven't seen young Michael around today. Agnes. Christina, Jack. All right, hey. He's making kites, if you don't mind. Oh, and I'm yet to meet your husband. I'm not married. Huh. Uh, Michael's father was here earlier, <laughs> Jack. Uh, Jerry Evans. He's a Welshman, not that that's relevant. So you're never married? No. We're all in the same boat, Jack. We're hoping that you'll hunt about and get men for all of us. Oh. So Michael is a love child. I... <laughs> yes, I suppose so. Oh, he's a fine boy. He's not a bad boy. You're lucky to have him? We're all lucky to have him. In Rianga, women were eager to have love children. The more love children you had, the more fortunate your household was thought to be. <coughs> have you any other love children? <gasps> she certainly has not, Jack! <laughs> and as strange as it may seem to you, neither has Maggie, nor Agnes, nor Rose, nor myself. No harm to Rianga, but you're home in Donegal now. And as much as we <coughs> cherish love children here, they aren't exactly the norm. And the doctor says that if you don't take exercise, your legs are going to seize up on you. So, I'm going to walk you down to the main road and up again three times. And then you are going to read the paper from front to back. And then you are going to take your medicine and then you are going to go to bed. And we will do the same thing tomorrow and the day after and the day after that till we have you back to what you were. You start off, I'll be with you in a second. Where's my cardigan? Some of Aunt Kate's forebodings weren't all that inaccurate. Indeed, some of them were fulfilled before the festival of Lusa was over. She was right about Uncle Jack. 
He had been sent home by his superiors, not because his mind was confused, but for reasons that became clearer as the summer drew to a close. And she was right about losing her job in the local school. The parish priest didn't take her back when a new term began, and that had more to do with Father Jack than with the falling numbers. And she had good reason for being uneasy about Rose, and had she known, Agnes too. But what she couldn't have foreseen was that the home would break up quite so quickly, so that one morning in early September, both Agnes and Rose would be gone forever. But she was wrong about my father. I suppose their natures were so out of tune that she would always be wrong about my father, because he did come back in a couple of weeks, as he said he would. And although my mother and he didn't go through a conventional form of marriage, once more they danced together, witnessed by the unseen sisters. Just there, in ritual circles, round and round that square, and then down the lane, back up again. Mm. Slowly, formally, with easy deliberation, my mother, with her head thrown back, her eyes closed, her mouth slightly open, my father holding her just that little distance so that he could regard her upturned face. No singing, no melody, mm. no words, mm. just the swish and whisper of their feet across the grass. I watched the whole ceremony from behind that bush. But this time, they were conscious only of themselves and of their dancing. And when he went off to fight with the International Brigade, my mother grieved as any bride would grieve. Except this time, there was no sobbing, no lamenting, no collapse into a depression. start for another 10 days. God, I always hate school. You and I have a little financial matter to discuss. You hear me, Cub? I'm not listening. Three weeks ago, I bet you a penny those old cats would never get off the ground, and they never did. You owe me money? I do not. Oh, yes, you do. They never got off the ground, those cats. Because there's never enough wind, that's why. Enough wind. Would you listen to him? A hurricane would have shift those things. Anyhow, a debt is a debt. One penny, please, at your convenience. Or the equivalent in kind, one wild woodbine. Beside your caravan, Leave me alone, Maggie. Bright. I'll be now your what you made me do. bond just the for all tonight. The frank opinion, Cub, am I? Vagabond material. Get out of my road, will you? I'm trying to write a letter. Who to? That's for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> Whoever it is, they'd have to be smart to read that scroll. It's the Santa Claus. In September? Nothing like getting in before the rush. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you asking for? A bell. A bell. For my bicycle. For your bicycle? The bike my daddy has bought me, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy has bought your bicycle. Ask him yourself. It's coming next week. It's 
It's a black bike, a man's bike. Your daddy told you that. It's going to be delivered here to the house. He promised me. As long as he promised you. Now, who can we get to teach you how to ride? I know how to ride. You don't? I learned at school last Easter, so there. But you can't ride. I can so. I know you can. Maybe not by myself, but put me on the bar cub. Magnificent. You've never sat on the bar of a bicycle in your life, but Matthew. Yes, I did, Michael. Oh, yes, indeed I did. Now, away and write to Santa some other time. On a day like this, you should be out running the fields like a young calf. Wait. I have new riddles for you. Give up. A man goes to a tree with two apples on it. He doesn't take apples off it. He doesn't leave apples on it. How does he do it? Give up. Think. Give up. Well, since you don't know, he takes one apple off. Get it? He doesn't take apples off. He doesn't leave apples on. God. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well be talking to a turf stack. <laughs> oh, did I hear the church bell ring again? Big posh wedding today. Not one of my sisters. No such luck. A man, for, a man called Austin Morgan and a girl from Carrickfad. Oh, Austin Morgan. Should I know that name? I don't think so. They own the arcade in the town. And how are you today, Jack? Oh, cold as usual, Maggie. And complaining about it as usual. Complain away, why wouldn't you? It is getting colder. But you're looking stronger every day, Jack. Oh, and I feel stronger too. Now? Offer my last walk of the day. Number three. Oh, number four. Down past the clothesline, across the stream, around the old well and up through the meadow. And when that's done, Kate won't have to nag at me. <laughs> nag. Nag. Uh, that's something wrong with that. Uh, nag. Sounds funny. Nag? That's not a word, is it? Nag, yes. Keep on at somebody. Yes. Nag. <laughs> Good. The <laughs> <laughs> camera is coming back to. Great. Still sounds a bit strange, though. Time for another walk, Jack. Oh, just about to set out on number four, and thank you for keeping <clears throat> at me, Kate. No sign of Rose and Agnes yet. They said they'll be back for tea. Go away picking blackberries. You used to pick blackberries, do you remember? Down beside the old quarry. The very place. Oh, mother and myself. Every Lunasa, the annual ritual. Of course I remember. And then she would make the most wonderful jam. Oh, you used to take that to school with you every day through the winter. A piece of soda bread and blackberry jam. But no butter. Except on special occasions when you got scones. And for some reason they were always buttered. I really should walk down to that quarry one of these days. Oh, ruddier than the cherry. Oh, sweeter than the berry. Oh, nymph more bright than moonshine light. Like kidlings blithe and merry. Oh, oh, oh. where on earth did that come from? You see, Kate, it's all coming back to me. So you're going to start saying mass again? Oh, yes, indeed. Here in the house. Oh, why not? Perhaps I'll start next Monday. Oh, would the neighbors care to join us? They surely would. A lot of them have asked me about it already. Hmm. Uh, what Okawa does? Uh, you know Okawa, don't you? Your houseboy. Oh, my friend, my mentor, my counselor, and yes, uh, my houseboy as well. Anyhow, Okawa rings a huge iron gong to summon our people. Uh, did you hear the wedding bell this morning, Kate? Yes. Well, Okawa's gong travels four times as far as that. But if it's one of the bigger ceremonies, he'll spend the whole day going around all the neighboring villages, blowing on this enormous flute he made himself. And they all meet in your church. Oh, when I had a church. Now we meet in the common in the middle of the village. If it's one of the more important ceremonies, you could have up to three or four hundred people. All gathered together for mass? <laughs> Maybe. Or maybe to offer sacrifice to Obi, our great goddess of the earth, so that the crops will flourish. Or maybe to get in touch with our departed fathers for their advice and wisdom. Or maybe to thank the spirits of our tribe if they've been good to us. Or to appease them if they're angry. 
I complain to all power that our calendar of ceremonies gets fuller every year. Like at this time of year, uh, the Ugandan harvest time, we have two very wonderful ceremonies. The festival of the new yam and the festival of the sweet cassava. And they're both dedicated to our great goddess Obi. But these aren't Christian ceremonies, are they, Jack? Oh, no, the Ryangans have always been faithful to their own beliefs, like these two festivals I'm telling you about. And they're really wonderful, very magnificent ceremonies. Uh, I haven't told you about these two festivals before in detail, have I? Not to me. Well, it begins very formally, very solemnly, with the ritual sacrifice of a fowl a goat or a calf down at the bank of the river. Then it's the cutting and anointing of the first yams and the first cassava, and they're passed around in huge wooden bowls. Then the incantation, a chant, really, that expresses our gratitude and acts as a rhythm or percussion for the ritual dance. Oh, chaka ta chaka ta chaka And then, when the Thanksgiving is over, the dance continues. And the interesting thing is, is it grows naturally into a secular celebration, so that almost imperceptibly, the religious ceremony ends and the community celebration takes over. And that part of the ceremony is a real spectacle. We light fires around the periphery of the circle and we paint our faces with colored powders, and we sing local songs, and we drink palm wine, and then we dance, and dance, and dance, and dance. Men, women, children, most of them lepers, many of them with missing limbs, with misshapen limbs, dancing, believe it or not, for days on end. Oh, it is the most wonderful sight you have ever seen. And that palm wine, you lose all sense of time. Oh, yes, uh, the Ryangans are remarkable. <laughs> their capacity for fun, for laughing, for practical jokes, they've such open hearts. In some respects, they're much like us. There's no distinction between the religious and the secular in their community. Uh, you should come back with me, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get into all that? You, you really must stop me from telling all these long stories. Exercise time. I'll be back in ten minutes. Oh, and just last week it took me half an hour to do number four. You're doing a great job with me, Kate. And keep on nagging at me. <laughs> it's not Gilbert and Sullivan, is it? Sorry? Oh, that quotation! What's that, Jack? Oh, readier than the cherry. Oh, sweeter than the berry. <sighs> nope, it's not Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll come back to me, I promise ya. It'll all come back to me. Jack? Oh, yes. You are going to start saying mass again, aren't you? Oh, we've agreed on next Monday, haven't we? Uh, Maggie, haven't we? Yes. At first light, the moment rose as white cock crows. A harvest ceremony. You'll have to find a big iron gong somewhere, Kate. <laughs> Told you! You wouldn't believe me. I told you! It's not back a month yet. What do you think? It needs more time. This morning I heard all about the spirits of the tribe. And this afternoon I heard all about the medicine man that brought the woman back from death. You saw how he dodged about when I mentioned mass. He said he'll say mass next Monday, Kate. No, he won't. You know he won't. He's changed, Maggie. In another month, he'll be completely changed. He's not our Jack at all. That's what he's changed into that frightens me. Doesn't frighten me. If it's seen your face, of course it does. Oh, dear God. All the same, I don't think it's a sight I'd like to see. What sight? 
plateau of lepers trying to do the military two-step? Maggie Mundy, God forgive you. The poor creatures are as entitled to. <laughs> this must stay in the family. Not a word must go outside these walls. Do you hear me? <coughs> Not a syllable. No false modesty. You know you're a great dancer, Chrissy. No, I'm not. You should be a professional dancer. You're talking rubbish. Let's dance from the garden again. We've done that already. And down the lane and up again. Without music. That's enough for one day. Tell me about signing up. Was it really in a church? I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. It was a real church. A Catholic church as a matter of interest. I don't believe a word of it. Would I tell you a lie? Not at the end, in the sanctuary, there were three men, two of them in trench coats, and between them, behind this left turn, and wearing a sort of military cap, this little chappy, who spoke in an accent I could hardly understand. Naturally, I thought he was Spanish. From Armand, as it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he couldn't understand you either. <laughs> he described himself as the recruiting officer. Take it from me, comrade. Nobody joins the brigade without my unanimity. <laughs> it's a wonder he accepted you. Do you offer your allegiance and your loyalty and your full endeavors to the Popular Front? What's the Popular Front? The Spanish government that I'm going to keep in power. I take it that you're a syndicalist? No. An anarchist? No. A Marxist? No. A Republican? A Socialist? A Communist? No. Do you speak Spanish? No. Can <laughs> you make explosives? No. Can you ride a motorbike? Yes? You're in, sign here! So you'll be the dispatch writer? Mm. And you leave on Saturday? First time. For how long will you be away? As long as it takes to sort the place out. Seriously, Jerry? Maybe a couple of months. Everybody says it will be over by Christmas. They always say it will be over by <coughs> Christmas. And I still don't know why you're going. Not so sure I know either. Who wants salesmen that can't sell? And there's bound to be something right about the call, isn't there? And it's somewhere to go, isn't it? Maybe that's the important thing for a man. A name the destination. Democracy. Valley Bend. Heaven. Women's illusions aren't so easily satisfied. They make better drifters. <laughs> Anyhow, he held out a pen to sign on the dotted line. And it was only when I was writing my name that I glanced over the lectern and saw the box. What box? He was standing on the box. The chap, he was a midget. Terry. <laughs> no bigger than three feet. Terry, I promise you. And when we were having a drink afterwards, he told me he was invaluable to the brigade because he was a master at disguising himself. <laughs> Terry Evans. Let's go down to the old well. We're going nowhere. Come inside and take a look at this wireless. It stops and starts whenever it feels like it. I told you I know nothing about radios. I've said you're a genius at them. Chrissy, <coughs> I don't even you know can how try, to. You try, can't you? Come on, my poem is it back. You should see Jack striding through the, through the meadow. He looks like a new man. Where are you talking to him? He wants to do a swap with me. I'm to give him this hat, and he's to give me some sort of a three-cornered hat, with feathers, that the district commissioner gave him. Sounds of fair exchange. Chris says you're equipped with radios, Jerry. I'll take a look at it. Why not? <laughs> All I can say is that it's not the, the battery. I got a new one yesterday. Let me check the aerial first. <laughs> Very often, that's where the trouble lies. Then I'll have a look at the ignition and sparking plugs. <laughs> Leave it to Jerry. <laughs> he sounds very knowledgeable. It might be something he can't fix. I know you're not responsible for Jerry's decisions, Christina, but it would be on my conscience if I didn't tell you how strongly I disapprove of this whole international brigade caper. It's a sorry day for Ireland when we have to send our young men off to fight for godless communism. 
For democracy, Kate. I'm not going to argue. I just wanted to clear my conscience. And that's the impo important thing, of course. And now you've cleared it. Turn the radio on, Chrissy, would you? It's on. Right. <laughs> Just as we were coming out of the town, we met with Zira McLaughlin, the knitting agent. Agnes and Rose aren't back yet? They'll be back soon. She says she'll call in tomorrow and tell them herself. The poor woman was very distressed. Tell them what? She's not buying any more handmade gloves. Why not? <sighs> Too dear, she says. Too dear! She pays them a pittance! There's a new factory started up in Donegal Town. They make machine gloves more quickly there and far more cheaply. The people of Vera used to supply by their gloves directly from the factory now. She says they're organizing buses to bring the workers to the factory and back every day. Most of the people who used to work at home have signed on. It's awful news, Chrissy. She tried to get a job there herself. They told her she was too old. Oh, God. She's 41. The poor women could hardly speak. Poor Aggie, poor Rosie. What will they do? Uh, sh they're back. Uh, let them have their tea in peace. We'll tell them later. Who is that beautiful woman? Jerry? Up here, Aggie. Where? On top of the sycamore. <laughs> Mother of God. Come up and join me. What are you doing up there? You can see the future from here, Aggie. The trees and save, Jerry. Please come down. Come up and see what's going to happen to you. The branch is dead, Jerry. I'm telling you. Do you think I could get a job in a circus? Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Jerry! Pass the air. Stop it, Jerry. The greatest of stop me. it, stop it. Woo! That daring young man. You're going to fall. I'm, flying I'm not looking. I'm not watching. Of a man is up on top of the sycamore. <coughs> Go out and tell him to come down, Chrissy. He's fixing the aerial. He's going to break his neck, I'm telling you. As long as he fixes the wireless first. <laughs> <laughs> How are the blackberries, Agnes? Just that bit too ripe. We should have picked them a week ago. Mm. Is that a purple stain on your gansy? I know. I only begun after I fell into a bush. And look at me hands. All scrubbed with briars. For all that sympathy I got from Rosie, <laughs> nearly died laughing at me. How is she now? Is she still in bed? Bed? She wasn't feeling well. She said she'd come home to lie down. She's here, isn't she? I haven't seen her. Have you? No. How long ago did she leave you? <sighs> Hours ago. I don't know. Almost immediately after we got to the old quarry. She said she felt out of sorts. And she went off by herself? Yes. To come home? That's what she said. She's not in her bed. Oh, God. Where could she? Start at the beginning, Agnes. What exactly happened? Nothing happened. Nothing at all. We left her together. When was that? Just after one o'clock. That means she's missing for over three hours? We walked together to the quarry. She was chatting away as usual. I had me two buckets and she had a bottle of... Go on, go on! And just after we got there, she said she wasn't feeling well. I told her not to bother about the blackberries, just sit in the sun, and that's what she did. For how long? I don't know, five, ten minutes? And then I fell into the bush and that's when she laughed and she said... She said... I've forgotten what she said. Something about a headache and her stomach being sick and she'd come home to sleep for a while. Are you sure she's not in her bed? Then what? Oh, where is she? What direction what did she go? Rosie? Stop sniveling, Agnes. Did she go towards home? I think so. Yes. I don't know. Maggie. She may have gone into the town. She wouldn't have gone into the town in her Wellingtons. She was wearing her good shoes. Are you sure? Yes. And her blue cardigan and her good skirt. I said to her, I said, you're some lady to go picking blackberries with. She just laughed and she said, I'm some tough, Aggie. Aren't I some tough? Had she a bottle of milk with her? I think so. Yes, in one of her cans. Had she any money with her? She had to have her crown. 
So she has. Danny Bradley. What? Who? Danny Bradley, Loch Anna, up in the back hills. Oh, God. What's no. this about the back hills? She has some silly notion about that scamp Bradley. She believes he's in love with her. He gave her a present last Christmas, she says. What do you know about this Bradley business? I know no more than Chris. I have often seen you and Rose whispering together. What plot has been hatched between Mr. Bradley and no Rose? No plot. You're lying to me, Agnes. Please, Kate. You're withholding. Honest to God. I want the truth. All I know is what Chris has I want to know everything now. I want to know. That'll do, Kate. Stop that at once. She may be in the town. She may be on her way home now. We have taken a weak turn on the way back from the quarry, but we are going to find her. You search the fields on the upper side of the lane. You take the lower side, go down as far as the main road. You go to the old well and search all around there. I'm going to town to tell the police. You're going to no police, Maggie. If she's mixed up with that Bradley creature, I'm not going to have it broadcast. I'm going to the police, and you'll do what I told you to do. There she is. Look, there she is. They're sweet. You got two campfuls. Good for you. Is your stomach settled? My stomach? We weren't feeling well, remember? And we were at the quarry. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm fine now. Thanks. You left me there, and you said you were coming home to lay down. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. But you didn't come home, Rosie. That's right. We were very worried about you. Well, here I am. Where are you in the town? That's why you're all dressed up, isn't it? You went into Ballybeg, didn't you? She's home, safe, and sound. And that's all that matters. Now, I don't know about you girls, but I can tell you this chicken is weak with hunger. Let me tell you what's on the menu for this evening. Our beverage is the usual hot, sweet tea. Now, we have a choice between wheat and bread and soda bread. Both fresh from the chef's oven. But here comes the difficulty. There's only three eggs between the seven of us. I wish to God you'd persuade that white rooster of yours to lay eggs, Rosie. There are eight of us, Maggie. Are there? Right. <laughs> Soldier up in the sycamore. Not a great larder, but a nice challenge for someone like myself. My suggestion is eggs, Ballybeg. In other words, scrambled and served on lightly toasted wheat and bread. Followed, for those so inclined, by one wild woodbine. Everybody happy? Excellent, Margaret. Settled. <laughs> we'll go and pick some more blackberries next Sunday, Rosie. All right. <laughs> Remember the cans you had? <coughs> you had your own two cans. Did you take them with you? Where to, Aggie? Into the town, wherever you went. I hid them at the quarry, behind the stone wall. They're safe there. I'll go back and pick them up later this evening. Does anybody know where my overall is? It's lying across your bed, Rosie. And you need to bring some turf in. I'll change first, Maggie. Be quick about it. How many pieces of toast do you want? All that loaf and go easy on the butter if that's all we have. Now, parsley and just a whiff of basil. I don't want you to be too optimistic, girls, but you should know I feel very creative this evening. I want to know where you were, Rosie. You've been gone for the entire afternoon. I'd like to know where you've been. Later, Kate, after you've we- You've been gone for the past three hours. Where were you? <coughs> Loch Anna. I didn't hear what you said, Rose. Loch Anna. Kate, just- You walked from the quarry to Loch Anna? Yes. Did you meet somebody there? Yes. Had you arranged to meet somebody there? I had arranged to meet Danny Bradley there, Kate. He brought me out in his father's blue boat. I don't want anything to eat, Maggie. Brought a bottle of milk and a packet of chocolate biscuits with me. 
and we had a picnic on the lake. Then the two of us went up to the back hills. He showed me what was left of the Luna Sapphires. Few of them are still burning away up there. We passed Yang Sweeney's house. You know, the boy who got burned, the boy you said was dying. Well, he's on demand, Danny says. His legs will be scarred, but he'll be all right. There was nobody there but Danny and me. It's a very peaceful place up there. He calls me his rosebud, Aggie. I've told you that before, didn't I? Then he walked me down as far as the workhouse gate, and I came on home by myself. And that's all I'm going to tell you. That's all any of you are going to hear. What has happened to this house? Mother of God. Will we ever be able to lift our heads again? The following night, Fair McLaughlin arrived and explained to Agnes and Rose why she couldn't buy their hand knitted gloves anymore. Most of her home knitters had already started working in a new factory, and she advised Agnes and Rose to apply immediately. The Industrial Revolution had finally caught up with Valley Bear. They didn't apply, even though they had no other means of making a living, and they never discussed their situation with their sisters. Perhaps Agnes made the decision for both of them because she knew Rose wouldn't have gotten work there anyway. Or perhaps, as Kate believed, Agnes was too notionate to work in a factory. Or perhaps the two of them just wanted away. Anyhow, on my first day back at school, when he went into the kitchen for breakfast, there was a note propped up against the milk jug. We are gone for good. This is best for all. Do not try to find us. It was written in Agnes's resolute hand. Of course, they did try to find them. So did the police. So did our neighbors, who had a huge network of relatives all over England and America. But they had vanished without trace. And by the time I tracked them down, 25 years later, in London, Agnes was dead, and Rose was dying in a hospice for the destitute. The scraps of information I gathered were too sparse to be coherent. By then I gathered, they moved about a lot. They worked as cleaning women in public toilets, in factories, in the underground. And when Rose could no longer get work, Agnes tried to support them both, but couldn't. By then I gathered as well. They took to drink. They gave up. They slept in parks, in doorways. Then, Agnes died of exposure. And two days after I found Rose in that grim hospice, she didn't recognize me, of course. She died in her sleep. Father Jack's health recovered quickly, and he soon regained his full vocabulary and all his old bounce and vigor. But he never said mass that following Monday. In fact, he never said mass again. But he never stopped wanting to go back to Uganda, and he still talked passionately about his life with the lepers there. And with each new anecdote came new revelations, and with each revelation, shocked, stunned, startled, poor on Kate, until finally, she reached on a phrase that appeased her, his own distinctive spiritual search, leaping around the fire and offering a little hen to Uka or Ito or whoever is not religion, as I was taught it and did know it. She said with a defiant toss of her head, he must make his own distinctive search. But when he died suddenly of a heart attack a year within his homecoming, my mother and Maggie mourned him sorely, but for years, Kate was inconsolable. My father set for Spain that Saturday. The last I saw of him was dancing in imitation of Fred Astaire, swinging his walking stick, Uncle Jack's ceremonial tricorn at a jaunty angle over his left eye. When he got to the gate, he turned back and he blew a dozen theatrical kisses to mother and me. He was wounded in Barcelona. He fell off his motorbike and he was left with a limp. The limp wasn't disabling, but it put an end to his dancing days. And that really distressed him. And even the role of main veteran, which she loved, could never compensate for that. He visited us occasionally, and each time, <laughs> he was on the brink of a new career. And he always proposed to mother, and he always promised to get me a new bike. But then the war came in 1939. His visits became more infrequent. Then he stopped coming altogether. Sometime in the mid-50s, I received a letter a curt note from a village in the south of Wales, from a young man also called Michael Evans. 
He had found my address among the belongings of his father, Jerry Evans. And he wanted me to know that Jerry Evans, the father we both shared, had died peacefully in the family home the previous week. Throughout his final illness, he was nursed by his wife and his three grown children who all lived and worked in the village. My mother never knew of that letter. I decided to tell her, decided not to, vacillated for years as my father would have done. And eventually, rightly or wrongly, I kept the information to myself. Well, at least that's good news. What's that? That the young Sweeney boy from the back hills is going to live. Good news indeed. Michael! Where are you? We need some turf brought in. Are you still up there? Don't stand there. I might fall on top of you. Have you any idea what you're doing? Come on up here to me. I'm sure I will. We never make love on top of a sycamore tree. If you fall and break your neck, he'll be too good for you. <coughs> <coughs> Nobody vanishes quicker than that Michael fellow when you need him. Had a real idea when I woke up this morning, Aggie. I thought to myself, what is it that Ballybeck badly needs and that Ballybeck hasn't got? A riddle. Give up. A dressmaker. So why doesn't Agnes Bundy, who has such clever hands, why doesn't she dress make? Clever hands. <laughs> She'd get a pile of work. They'd come to her from far and wide. She'd make a fortune. <coughs> Some fortune in Valley Bank. I'm telling you, it's the work for you. And the work isn't only interesting, or you wouldn't be ruining your eyes staring at grey wool eight hours a day. Do you notice how Rosie squints at things now? I'm telling you, it's the job for you, Aggie. Oh, holy God, girls, don't tell me I'm out of fags. How could that have happened? <laughs> You're a genius, Chrissy. Look at this, Kate. Misery, happiness. What a drag. What's keeping those wonderful legs, belly big? If I had to choose between a man of, say, 52, mm. widower, mm. plump, and one wild wood vine, what would I choose, Kate? I'd take fat so and I. <laughs> God, I really am getting desperate. <laughs> Maybe I should go back to Rianca with you, Jack. Oh, I know you won't, but I know you'd love it. Uh, Would you guarantee a man for each of us? <laughs> oh, I couldn't promise four men, but I should be able to get one husband for all of you. <laughs> Would you settle for that, girls? <laughs> one between the four of us? Oh, that's our system, and it works very well. One of you would be his primary wife and live with him in his largest hut. That'd be you, Kate. Maggie! And the rest of you <laughs> would be in his enclosure. Be like living on the same small farm. Snug enough, girls, isn't it? And what would be, hmm, what sort of duties would we have? Uh, cooking, cleaning, helping with the crops, washing, uh, the usual housekeeping sure, tasks. that's what we do anyway. Oh, I'm looking after his children. That he'd have by Kate? Maggie! Oh, oh, that he'd have by all of you. And what's so efficient about this system is the men, uh, the wives, and the children all make up a small commune where everybody looks after everybody else and cares for them. I'm completely in favor of it. It may be efficient, and you may be in favor of it, Jack, but I don't think it's what Pope Pius XI would consider to be the holy sacrament of matrimony. And it might be better if you start paying a bit more attention to our Holy Father, and a bit less to the great goddess, Iggy. Mm. Listen, and they have hens there too, Jack. Oh, well, we're overrun with hens. Don't dismiss it, girls. It has its point. What'd you be getting, Kate? Give my head peace, Maggie. Jerry has it going. Tell me this, Jack. What's the Swahili for? choo 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 -ki? Oh, you'd love the fiber too, Kate. I'm not listening to a word you're saying. Well, any good? Listen. Aha, uh -huh. leave it to the expert. Oh, I have something for you, Jerry. What's that? Uh, the, the bloomed hat. Uh, we agreed to swap. I'll uh, be with you in a second. <laughs> good work, Jerry. Thought it might be the aerial. That's the end of your trouble. <laughs> Dance with me, Agnes. 
Have a bit of sense, Jerry Evans. Dance with me, please. Dance with him, Aggie. I'm... Give me your hand. Who wants to dance with oh, this? professional dancer. It's too late for that. You could teach dancing in Bali Band. That's all they need. Maybe it is. <laughs> there you are, safe and sound. I wish to God I could dance like you, Aggie. I haven't a breath. Doesn't she dance elegantly? Always there, there Aggie. Unbelievable. Now, Chrissy, you and I... Not now. I wonder where Michael's got to. Come on, Chrissy. Just once more on the floor. Not now, I said. How are you thick? I'll dance with you, Jerry. You want to see real class? Certainly do, Maggie. Stand back, girls. This Shirley Temple needs a lot of space. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hold me close, Jerry. The old legs aren't too reliable. <laughs> Sick of that damn thing. What happened? What are you out there, Chrissy? We're only wasting the battery. And we won't get a new one until the weekend. <laughs> Wasn't to be, Jerry. There will be another day. That's a promise, Maggie. <laughs> Not a bad little set, that, huh? Peace, thanks be to God. Do you know what that thing has done? Killed all Christian conversation in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Vera McLaughlin's calling in tomorrow. She wants to talk to you and Rose. What about? Uh, I didn't tell you, did I? Her daughter got engaged. Which of them? Uh, the Harvest Festival is going to be just supreme that we've read. <laughs> Sophia! Isn't she still at school? Left last year. She's 15 and the lucky man's 16. Holy God, girls. You may pack it in. It's totally indecent, I'm telling you. 15 and 16, now you can't tell me that's not totally improper. It's the poor mother I feel sorry for. What does she want to talk to us about? Something about wool. Didn't sound too important. She probably won't call at all. Go ahead and dance, you two. Artists like Margaret Mundy cannot perform on demand. We need to be in touch with other forces first. Don't we, Jerry? Absolutely. <laughs> are we never going to eat, Maggie? Indeed we are. Outside in the garden. Eggs, belly bag, al fresco. Lunas is almost over. There are going to be many worms evening left. <laughs> Good idea, Maggie. Oh, I'll get the cups and plates. Are you all right? It's gone again, isn't it? Have I done something wrong? I switched it on again. That's all I did. Pick out those chairs, Jerry. What about the table? We'll just spread a cloth on the ground. Well, at least we know it's not the aerial. According to you? And if it's not the aerial, the next thing to check is the ignition. Ignition. Listen to that bluffer. Bluffer. Did you hear what you call me? Is that unfair, Agnes? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the back and see what's what. <laughs> Did he get at the hands? 
I don't think so. There's the door left open. They're all right. We'll save that itself. We'll get another white rooster for you, Rosie. Doesn't matter. And now put manners on him early on. I don't want another. Poor Rosie. I hardly expect him to lay eggs for us now. Yeah. Where's that Michael fellow got to? Michael! Watching us somewhere, hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Michael! Red girls missing. Knives, forks. Jesus, Mary Joseph! <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, my friend, where are you? I'll be here, Jerry. Oh, I put on my ceremonial clothes for the exchange. Wonderful uniform, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I could do with that for Spain. <laughs> oh, it was my uniform when I was chaplain to the British oh, Army during the Great War. We know only too well what it is, Jack. Mm -hmm. Splendid uniform, isn't it? Well, it was splendid. Needs a bit of clean up. Oh, Ocala's always dressing up in it. I really must give it to him one of these days to keep. It's just uh, not at all suitable <coughs> for the climate, Jack. Oh, it's just for the exchange then. I'll change back. <laughs> Now, what we do if I were at home when we swap our barter is this. I place my possession on the ground. Go ahead. On the ground anywhere, put it on the grass. Right at your feet. Yes. Now, take three steps away from it. That's the symbolic distancing of yourself from what you once possessed. Now, turn around just like this. That's excellent, a complete circle. That's a <laughs> formal rejection of what you want to Now, I go to where you're standing, and you go to the position that I have left. So, excellent! The exchange is now formally and irrevocably complete. Oh. Ah, this is my trial. And that is your tricorn hat. I'll put it on. And it, and it suits you. Oh, it doesn't it suit him? His head's too big. What about that? Is that better, Agnes? You're lovely. <laughs> no, this fat dog's lips are stalking, but sure. look down. Would you look at them, talking about the term people? Tea time, girls. Who won lick the tea? You can start again tomorrow. Let me finish off Lusa. Chrissy, put on Marconi. It's broken again. Oh, Jerry fixed it, didn't you? <laughs> then Chrissy got at it again. Possess that thing, if you ask me. I wish you wouldn't use language like that, Christina. <laughs> There's still great heat in that sun. Great harvest weather. I love September. Cooking time, girls. So wait a while, Maggie. Enjoy the bit of heat that's left. Next Sunday, then. Is that all right? What's next Sunday? We'll go and pick some more blackberries. Yes. Yes, whatever you say, Aggie. Not bad for a kid of seven. Very neatly made. Look at the artwork. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> I keep telling his mother she has a very talented son. So there, Mr. Evans. Have you all seen these? I hate them. <laughs> I think it looks <laughs> wonderful. Look, Jack. I'll tell you something. This boy isn't going to end up selling gramophones. Michael! He always vanishes when there's work to be done. I have new riddles for you. Why is a gramophone like a parrot? Maggie, because it, because it always, because it, God, I forgot to. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, Father Jack was dead within 12 months, and with him and Agnes and Rose all gone, the hearts seemed to have gone out of the house. Maggie took on the tasks Rose and Agnes had done, and pretended to believe that nothing had changed. My mother spent the rest of her life in the knitting factory, hated every day of it, and after a few years of doing nothing, Kate got the job of tutoring the young family of Austin Morgan, the arcade. But much of the spirit and fun had gone out of their lives. When my time came to go away, in a selfish way of young men, 
I was happy to escape. And so, when I cast my mind back to that summer of 1936, different kinds of memories offer themselves to me. But there's one memory of that Lunasa time that visits me most often. And what fascinates me about that memory is that it owes nothing to fact. In that memory, atmosphere is more real than incident, and everything is simultaneously actual and illusory. In that memory, the air is nostalgic with the music of the 30s. It drifts in from somewhere far away, a mirage of sound, a dream music that is both heard and imagined, that seems to be both itself and its own echo. Sounds so alluring, so mesmeric, that the afternoon is bewitched, maybe haunted by it. And what is so strange about that memory is that everybody seems to be floating on those sweet sounds, moving rhythmically, languorously, in complete isolation, responding more to the mood of the music than to its beat. When I remember it, think of it as dancing. Dancing with eyes half closed, because to open it would break the spell. Dancing as if language had surrendered to movement, as if this ritual, this wordless ceremony, were now the way to speak, to whisper private and sacred things, to be in touch with some otherness. Dancing as if the very heart of life and all its hopes might be found in those assuaging notes, those hushed rhythms, and those silent and hypnotic movements. Dancing as if language had surrendered to movement, because words no longer existed.